Hello folks, Dr. Matt Moynihan here. Um, this is a uh, video uh, of a talk that I gave on June 23rd, 2022 to the U.S. Army Futures Command. Um, the, just a background on the event, the Futures Command is a $4.7 billion budget organization that sits in Austin, Texas. And it's run by a three-star general. And their job is to assess the Army of 2040. Um, you, those familiar with DOD know that the DOD has long, long cycles. So 10 years is sort of a good benchmark for planning. And then these guys are supposed to be out in front of that and they're supposed to assess technology changes and look at how the army could use some of these things, uh, for various applications, um, Anyway, um, so this talk, I was invited to this talk as part of the Pittsburgh um, ter Army Terrain Tech Walk. It was a two-day event in person in Pittsburgh. Um, I got the invitation, uh, and so I went and presented uh, at a, a in-person event to groups of 15 to 20 officers. I did the presentation four times, and the last time, uh, General Richardson, who's a three-star general, uh, lieutenant general, uh, was in the talk. So it was pretty cool. Uh, I've never presented to somebody um, that high up in the food chain <laughs> in the military. So this was brief to a three-star general. I can proudly say that. Um, so let's get started. So just to give you a brief overview, uh, first thing I'm going to do is look at private nuclear fusion as a whole to give you a sense of the industry. Um, and my problem is, is that I know a lot about fusion, so my goal is to keep it as high level as possible because I could easily fall down a, a sort of an explanation hole here. <laughs> um, then we're going to look at one particular case study, which is uh, Commonwealth and how that case study is indicative of the larger trend. Just to spoil the surprise, the trend is adding superconductors to fusion concepts. Um, I believe that superconductivity plays in more than half the industry, half the companies in the industry. And a lot of these machines don't work unless you add material like superconductors that can run continuously. Even if your approach doesn't have magnets, like an ICF system, you can still use the superconductors on the back end for the power supply. So it works for Zap Energy, it works for Mifty, it works for Focused Energy, Marvel. Um, a lot of these companies can use these superconducting materials. These are big power hungry machines. Superconductors can supply a lot of current very quickly. So we're gonna look at that supply chain. Um, and it's a stand-in for the entire industry. We're going to look first at the superconducting wire, then the magnets, then pre-net fusion applications, which, by the way, is mostly shine work as neutron sources, and then post-net. And then we'll look at conclusions and next steps. Okay, so fusion is a completely new energy source. Does not exist yet. There is nowhere in the world where mankind is getting more power out than in. So this is akin to landing a man on the moon. And just like landing a man on the moon, there were seven or eight products that fell out of that. Uh, and there's a very similar story here. We, we build our first net power fusion reactor. Along the way, we're going to get dozens and dozens of other commercial, commercially useful spin-out stuff. It has a 70-year history, history of public research, government research, but in the past 20 to 30 years, it's transitioned from an academic ivory tower, national lab, university, esoteric research topic to a privately funded private industry. Um, the first commercial product that I have on record was uh, from 2000. And that was a neutron generator made by uh, John Sved at NSD Gradle, and I wanna recognize Mr. Sved, um, S-V-E-D, because he's sort of an unsung hero. He worked at Daimler Chrysler and saw the potential in fusers to become a commercial neutron source and worked tirelessly for many years to make that a reality. And in 2000, he actually premiered, for about $300,000, you could buy these compact neutron generators um, that were computer controlled systems and you could plug them into systems and they were doing nuclear fusion in a commercial product. 
And that first happened in 2000. So Sved isn't known um, as, as the first person to do that, but he should be. And that's why I'm going to recognize him in this talk. Startups have arisen, and right now I'm counting $5.5 billion in private capital across 20 to 30 firms. That number, that $5.5 billion, really depends on when you start tallying up investment. Um, if you look at the FIA, their number might be lower. Um, Sam Wurzel at, at RPE has an amount there, too. Um, I've, I've kept a personal uh, spreadsheet of funding announcements going back uh, more than more than 10 years. So my number is 5.5 billion. You know, it, it, it's debatable, but we're plus or minus, you know, maybe half a billion within there, depending on when you start. Now, a lot of these firms are, are high risk. This is still a very high risk activity. And so it, a lot of firms are going to fail. That's that's a given. And I made that very clear. The risk profile is still very high for many firms. So as an investor, if you put money in one specific firm, the odds of your success are very low. But But with so many players in the market, so many horses in this race, the odds that somebody gets there within the next five to 10 years uh, have gone way up, have gone way up. And especially if, for instance, one company collapsed, uh, it would seed the market with hundreds of trained workers that could be picked up by another firm. So um, all this risk is high, but as, a, as an industry, I think the odds that we get to net power has gone way, way up. And so that's what I wanted to stress. Uh, and more than half the industry does use superconductors, as I mentioned already. So I, I believe strongly that the field of superconductivity and the field of fusion will be tightly linked together over the next 10 to 15 years. And the military has uses for both, as does the commercial market. So let's look at one case study. Um, Commonwealth uh, was formed in 2017 by uh, six graduate students and staff at MIT. And they went out and raised $250 million, first with any and then later with subsequent investment. In 2019, they placed the largest order in the history of the superconducting industry. They put it out to the entire global marketplace. And they say anyone who can uh, meet this order in production and quality will get this money. And Superox, a Japanese-Russian firm, was able to meet that order uh, successfully. And they rebuilt their entire manufacturing line around plasma laser deposition on substrates. And so they were able to produce 160, 186 miles in nine months, which, is a, which, which was a breakthrough in, in production for the industry. So this is a fusion industry pushing a breakthrough in superconductivity, which is leading to a manufacturing breakthrough, which is making wire more prevalent, quality going up, and an amount of wire going up, which has ripple effects into other parts of the economy. Um, I would say that when you imagine this wire, don't imagine 186 miles of wire in one continuous long strand. <laughs> That's not how it went. The lengths were anywhere from 400 to 600 meters. So they were, they were in long chunks uh, and then they produced over 186 miles of that. So when you think about that, that's a lot of wire. Commonwealth receives that wire uh, at the beginning of 2021. They wind it, they weld it, they put it in one big form factor, and they break the world record in the fall of 2021, which is now um, sort of famous. And they've been there's been videos about that. So let's look at the supply chain itself. So. The military has uses for, for each piece of that technology, um, starting with the raw materials that come out of the mines. Now, the major these are rare earths. That's the first point, which means the competition for rare earths is just going to be more aggressive. And that's kind of terrifying because fusion itself operates without a fossil fuel source. So we're not fighting over fossil fuels anymore if we move to this fusion reactor as our energy source, but we are requiring rare earths. And that that is an issue because they're required for so many other um, commercial products, uh, cell phones, computers, chips. That, that rare earth becomes superconducting wire and the wire is wound into magnets or solenoids. That magnet then is applied to a fusion reactor, and it could be a Stellarator, Mirror, Tokamak, 
Um, pinch machines might even use this wire. Uh, it could be um, a rotating mirror. It could be a plasma jet system. PGMIF also applies. The magnets kind of cross cut across multiple companies, multiple technologies, multiple fusion approaches. But right now we're pre net. So fusion right now is not nicking power, but they do create neutrons and the neutrons have applications and shine technologies, uh, shine medical technologies in Wisconsin is the one that makes the most of this. So I'm going to talk a lot about their stuff. And then of course, hopefully within the next five to 10 years, we have fusion energy for the military. I didn't really go into powering forward bases. Um, although that's an option at this time, I thought that was a little bit too far out and I'd already sort of said a lot of very compelling technology stuff. So anyway, so we're going to look at each piece of this. So let's look first at the wire applications. Now, superconductors are not new to DOD, not at all. Um, ever since the Rebco breakthrough of the 1980s, the military's had somebody looking at this uh, at all times. And there is latent talent in the Army, and I def there definitely is latent talent in the Navy, um, focused on superconductivity. But what's happening now is that fusion is creating this market demand signal that didn't exist before, which is driving the commercialization and industrialization of superconductors, which have been around for a long time. And that's going to raise the production quantity and quality of wire, especially as the superox breakthrough ripples into the rest of the commercial space. And so um, that's going to lower cost, which is a huge barrier. Uh, it also, I believe, is going to solve a lot of related problems that are known, established problems. Superconducting has uh, quench issues, insulation issues, joint issues. How do you join two magnets together? Winding and cooling issues, uh, the cooling designs. And so Fusion is driving all of these improvements uh, in the commercial market. Now, I want to stress that this is mobile technology because it can be put on um, uh, aircraft and, and vehicle platforms, but it's not man portable. Uh, superconductors require coolant systems, cryo cooler systems. They're nitrogen cooled systems, so 77 Kelvin or below. Um, and so that means that there are limits to where it can be used. But the wire itself is anywhere from 100 to 1,000 times more efficient than nominal copper wire. In fact, uh, during the lecture, I had a hands-on exhibit, which I, I know I'm, not, I'm not showing a picture of, but I went out and, and made about 77 copper, gauge 10 copper wires are equivalent to a thin layer of, of HTS. So where could we apply this? Electric vertical lift vehicles are one easy one. Um, an all superconducting air platform like uh, the Boeing Defiant, SB1 Defiant aircraft, uh, would have longer loitering, loitering times, larger payroll uh, payloads, and better ISR. Um, also, mobile uh, directed energy weapon, weapons platforms. Um, the directed energy systems are power hungry, so they need a lot of electricity very quickly. Um, so the superconducting storage systems could apply the current quickly uh, from a storage tank directly to the laser system. Uh, and so you could see a ground vehicle being applied for that. And of course, that also applies for the Navy as well. All right, so the wire can also be coiled and that makes a magnet. Um, superconductors are wound into solenoids. Those solenoids can be applied to motors, generators, energy storage systems, and the energy storage systems could also be used to smooth out inter intermittent power sources like solar panels or wind turbines. Um, there is a lot of uh, ground that can be gained in the, the winding of the wire itself. Uh, so for one example, in 2019, um, National High Magnetic Field Lab developed a solenoid design that eliminated the twist in the superconductor, and that led to a two-fold efficiency in the solenoid itself. So what that tells me is not just can there's not just room to innovate and improve the technology in the wire, but also how the wire is built, wound, weld, welded, and controlled. And so there's a lot of lot of stuff that can happen here that we could get a huge advantage. And then with energy storage, um, the the energy storage goes at the V field squared, so a forty Tesla field holds roughly six hundred. 
and 36 megajoules of power in a one square meter. I thought that was a lot uh, until I Googled um, how much ga- how much a gallon of diesel fuel holds. Apparently, a gallon of diesel fuel holds 125 roughly megajoules of power. So it, it, it wasn't as impressive as I initially thought. But the other thing is that the power can come out almost instantaneously, which makes it totally unique. You see there in the chart on the right, when you compare it to batter, batteries, supercapacitors, lead atom, acid batteries, metal batteries, flow batteries, flywheels. Um, SMEZ has a lot of unique characteristics. Also, it has a high efficiency. You can put the power in with above 90% efficiency depending on how the machine is designed. So it's a a great way to store energy, put it in, get it out quick without losses uh, in the the machine. All right, so let's change gears for a second and go back to fusion. Um, Right now, of course, nothing makes power. So fusion is pre-net power. uh, And they have uses as mainly neutron sources. And this blows many people away, but um, since 2000, since um, 2013, roughly, you can go out and buy a commercial fusion neutron source. Um, there's a picture of one in the upper right. It's called the Thunderbird. It's made by Shine Medical Technologies. Um, and for a million bucks, you can buy this machine about the size of a car that will fuse for 182 hours continuously. And that produces a beam of neutrons, and those neutrons can be applied to various applications uh, of interest. And so here's a short list. Medical isotope generation is, of course, the goal of Shine. Uh, that's a 5 to $6 billion a year market, uh, and I believe that they will crush that market. They, they already have the site licenses from the NRC, and they're, they're almost completed their first plant, or their second plant, excuse me, in Janesville. They also have a plant going up in, in Europe. So um, that's an exciting market. It can also be used for weapons effects effects testing. It's not totally um, convertible because the neutron output doesn't exactly correlate to what you get from a nuclear bomb, but the military uses weapons effects testing. And this this is probably smaller, more compact, and cheaper than whatever they are using. I mentioned the Molly G site. Um, For those of us in the military classified environments, we'll know what that means. It can also be used to scan nuclear fuel. The neutrons uh, can do that. Uh, Shine has uh, published some stuff on the web about that, and uh, there may be some. They may have a, a collaboration with Westinghouse to do that to deliver a system to do that. Uh, you can test uh, fission reactor parts under neutron loads, which is of interest. You can also use it for boron neutron capture therapy, which is obviously what TAE is doing. So they they have a medical um, division and they're trying to apply that in China. Uh, The way it works is you you take a boron molecule, attach it to a protein, send the protein into the patient's body. It goes to the tumor cell, latches in, then you fire neutrons through the human tissue. That neutron hits the boron. It explodes, killing the cancer. So it's basically like a sniper for cancer, uh, and TAE is going after that market. Um, so it's using fusion to kill cancer cells. It's really cool. Uh, Sh- uh, Shine also has uh, won a $16 million grant from the Department of Homeland Security to use this system to image shipping containers at ports. So they're going to see if they can set up a system where shipping containers come in, they're scanned using neutrons, and they're looking for contraband. And then, of course, there is the proposal. Um, you can use the, the neutrons from these generators to blast spent nuclear fuel. And when you do that, you can push the fuel down the decay chain to its daughter products, making the stuff safe, safe to put in the ground. So this is actually quite a long list. And you know, if I were to add up all the markets that this stuff touches, I mean, we're looking at easily easily 20 billion dollars probably more um in in different markets where this technology would play a role uh and it's funny because once you know 10 years ago i wouldn't have even guessed that there was this many applications for it i mean we're all just excited about the fact that we put fusion in a compact form factor and got it to run at 
20 to the 13th. And it's kind of funny because once you build the thing, then you realize, oh my gosh, there's like all these different places where it could be applied and there's all these different great markets where you can sell it. So it's kind of interesting. And then of course there's fusion energy itself, um, which is exciting. Uh, there are many great companies in this race. Uh, I pointed out uh, at least nine here, but I would say that there are more. I'm going to add this little et cetera at the end because I believe there are more companies coming. Not all these companies are American. Um, so I'm going to point out Tokamak Energy, which is a British company, has made a lot of progress. It, within the last uh, five months, it proved 100 million degrees Kelvin plasma, which no private firm had ever done before. Uh, if you're sitting in, in policy situations or military applications in Washington or, or around the country, um, you should want uh, the United States to lead here. Whatever nation gets there first is going to have a lot of political um, goodwill type stuff happen to them. So it's really important that the United States lead on this. And then, yeah, if, if this happens, there's the ability to do power, powering forward operating bases. Um, I did mention the Lockheed Martin effort, which is still going on uh, at a reduced uh, level. But I, I mentioned that as a potential uh, form factor, compact form factor. Okay, so that pretty much sums up the talk. Uh, the, the Army was very pleased, I think. I had a lot of lieutenant colonels <laughs> and majors trying to buy me a beer at the networking event afterwards. Uh, I had a lot of people that volunteered to buy the book. I think you should buy the book if you're hearing this talk. Go get the book, find it on my website, uh, and take care.